Now we're going to our uh, next session, or I think the final session is going to be moderated by Professor Joseph Natai. Professor Joseph Natai is the Dean of the Faculty of Economics, Energy and Management at Macquarie University. Uh, as I said, whenever I, I, I say anything uh, um, uh, good about the university, I will get criticism why you just mentioned this university. But Macquarie University is one of the leading universities in Africa. For a long time, we've been dealing with them well-respected university. That doesn't mean there's so many universities in the whole African region. But uh, just to say a few words uh, for African scientists, scholars, I've been dealing, I'm an African myself. One of the, with the issues where we try to work closely with our colleagues and friends and partners in Africa, uh, all these things we know, internet, connectivity, electricity, and everything. And I have given the example of Professor Joseph Natai many times, even I gave it to a minister before I said to her, Look, this is an example. In the last conference, he was talking to us as in the last example, if you don't mind me saying this, Professor Joseph, because he, right. in Uganda, he also got the care view of the COVID-19. He knows the electricity cut. He knows the internet. To make, he made huge efforts to make sure he will be there on the conference. So he went the day before the conference. He recorded his talk. He sent it to us. He said, in case tomorrow anything happened, this is my video. So people can make extra efforts. The other thing which I would like to send the message about uh, as example of Professor Joseph Natai here, the only way to get connected with us in the UK or in the OCDs or across the whole world, if connectivity is very important. You send him an email, you get a reply. Many times you send an email. We wait like <laughs> 10 weeks. Then someone will come, oh, where is my paper? It's not being published. We said, even you haven't even acknowledged the reviewer's comment. So this is not the case. That's why I can see when I looked into the, the publisher in one of our major journals, he sent us the report. We can see his university is massively contributing, publishing uh, many journals in the, our, uh, many articles in our journal because they are really robust. They're communicating and they're dealing very, very well. Okay. Now, uh, he is a professor of, uh, he will introduce himself quickly, but He's a well-respected and distinguished scholar from Africa. I really admire him. He's a part of many international uh, associations like the Charter Institute of Marketing, Project Management. He's a well, uh, he's, a, he's a real true leader. He's someone very open to international collaboration. And that's why I'm very glad we managed to bring him to lead this session because you can see the speakers are all very well internationally looking for partnership like Mark and Rada and all of them. So I wouldn't talk that long. I will hand over to the chair and he, you are in a safe hand and I will see you at the end. Uh, so Professor Joseph, it's all yours now. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Alam Ahmed uh, for the kind introduction. Uh, let me go straight at the session. I'm Joseph Ntai, I've already been introduced. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this session addresses uh, the future strategies and approaches for higher education in the Middle East and North Africa. And um, when we draw from the lessons we picked yesterday and today, it is clear that uh, COVID-19 has undeniably changed the education landscape. And of course, as schools and colleges and universities prepare to reopen, it will be crucial that they develop learning programs that can accommodate students, no matter the learning environment. And uh, as COVID-19 pandemic continues, uh, higher education institutions must develop sustainability strategies alluded, uh, alluded to uh, by Professor Mark Smith uh, yesterday when he was addressing us. And we know very well that higher education institutions must develop resilient teaching models. And these are some of the things that have been discussed today and yesterday. And uh, of course, these robust, flexible teaching models that facilitate learning experiences uh, should be designed to be adaptable to fluctuating conditions and disruptions uh, which are likely to occur in future. And uh, of course, uh, during the next phases of the pandemic, uh, higher education institutions everywhere must be ready to shift to a fully online format uh, at a short notice. And uh, uh, of course, we know that very well. And uh, since today is not uh, my day, uh, really, uh, I just wanted to give that introduction. Uh, this session handles future strategies and approaches for higher education um, in the Middle East and uh, North Africa. And uh, this session will provide a conversation on higher education institutions and suggest tools they need to facilitate learning. 
Uh, this session specifically discusses uh, a number of papers, as you have seen on the program. And uh, we've got uh, around um, uh, five people, uh, distinguished professors and researchers who are going to make presentations. Um, yeah, um, my rapporteur today will be Dr. Amil uh, Abdullah Machin, uh, who is an as assistant professor in the Management Information Systems Department, College of Administration and Economics, University of Mosul, Iraq. Uh, allow me, ladies and gentlemen, uh, to introduce our first speaker. And uh, I think I'll give her an opportunity to speak and then uh, allow her to leave because she has an important engagement. And then thereafter, I'll introduce the rest of the speakers. Uh, so the first paper will be enhancing participation of women in STI and business uh, formation. And this will be delivered by Professor Gada Amel. And Professor Gada Amel is a vice dean uh, for postgraduate studies and research, uh, College of Engineering, uh, Bena University, and the chair Center of Strategic Studies for Science and Technology, and vice president Arab Science and Technology Foundation in Egypt. Uh, over to you, Professor Gada Amel. You've got 12 to 15 minutes to deliver your paper. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for everyone. Uh, and thank you for Dr. Alam for inviting me for a very important uh, event. I'm very happy to be among all of you today. I will go direct to my presentation because the time, uh, my presentation today is something related to how we can change uh, the higher education uh, and support women uh, to not search for job, to create her, her own job. Uh, so my presentation today with title Enhancing Participation of Women in Science, Technology, Innovation and Business Formation. Uh, in my presentation, I will focus in some challenges that we are facing uh, in the uh, Middle East and North Africa. And I believe uh, the same problem that we're facing also in developing country in some also and in some uh, uh, internationals and uh, in, in international levels, we have the same problems. Uh, so the importance of entrepreneurship, as we all know, that the entrepreneurship is very important for uh, sustainable, sustainable development for any country, uh, even if it were women or men, um, it will lead uh, the coming future, especially with the fourth industrial revolution transformation that's happening now. We need the entrepreneurship because we will have uh, to have our know-how. We have to understand that the new market that are already we are living in now. Uh, and unfortunately, the entrepreneurship is becoming uh, a more attractive career path for adults. Women is still special in the Middle East and mm -hmm. the North Africa. Women is still lag behind their male counterparts. And especially when coming to making uh, the risky decision to start her own business. Uh, she always afraid because there's a lot of challenges around here. Uh, and these challenges will explain uh, there are too much challenges, but I will focus in the main eight challenges that I saw after uh, my long trip uh, in entrepreneurship and uh, in Arab Science and Technology Foundation, it's NGO. And this NGO will work um, and create innovation and entrepreneurship uh, in all uh, uh, Arab countries uh, and all Arab countries are Arab peoples, but we are focused in women sometimes. And we found that these are the main problems that women faces in this part of the world. So the challenges is a complex combination of internal and external and physiological issues that women are facing. The first one, if we start with women's education choices, and this is starting not only in the higher education, before the higher education. Uh, some people put um, the mind in the, in, in, uh, the girl in the, um, in the, uh, uh, the pre-college that you should be beautiful, you should marry, and this very um, important issue. But the more important they have to focus uh, and give her the passion that you should lead. You can become a scientist and have your own business. Uh, so the women's educational choice put uh, the number of women uh, that can uh, make a potentially set up a business in science and technology or turn her innovation or her idea to real uh, product that the market can acceptable is uh, lower. Uh, than men in this part of the world. This is the number one, the educational choices from the beginning, always divert the woman away from uh, entrepreneurship and uh, from innovation. The second thing that entrepreneurship, science and technology, innovation, inventions are concept mostly associated with men in this part of the world and really in, the, in other uh, uh, worlds in, in the world. And this resulting in women related to ventures, innovation and invention be less recognized as a valuable business idea. Yani if the woman have a great idea, 
everyone will look for her in doubtly. Yeah, we need to, to, uh, to uh, you have to double your effort to, to prove your idea. The market didn't accept her idea uh, uh, easily. Uh, not, not like the, the men, because they always put uh, the science, technology, innovation, uh, and the invention in the side of men, not women. The third thing that we are facing, the pervasive stereotype of women capacity and leadership. Women are always uh, perceived by market stakeholders as less credible or less professional. They look at her that you are less professional. There is doubtly always uh, for her. And this put a uh, woman in entrepreneurs to be always under stress of, uh, to prove herself and double her knowledge and the skills and the capacity to prove himself in front of clients, suppliers, bankers, financiers, and the business partners. And as you see the photo I put at the cartoon, the man coming asking her or asking how can girl run a business? And this is really we're facing. Uh, even in the leadership and university and everywhere, always they look you, are you really lead this uh, sector? Uh, I don't know why. Yeah, I don't know why but the stereotype uh, for the moment, they look at her and uh, uh, they don't trust that we can do something uh, in science and technology or entrepreneurship. Also, the traditional about the rule of women in society, uh, especially in uh, uh, Middle East and North Africa, we have more responsibility compared with the other uh, females around the world. And we are very happy with this responsibility, but we need uh, two things. The policy help us to, uh, to be a good uh, mother and also to be uh, a good worker and uh, also to have uh, this passion to, to uh, prove um, ourselves. And this is not important for females, but it's important also for the community and for the country itself. And I will show now uh, why this is very important. The fifth thing, the difficulties in increasing finding and accessing, uh, accessing finance. And this generally it's for um, women and entrepreneur to access finance is very difficult because I mentioned before, as I mentioned before, uh, the financer look at the woman and doubtly that she cannot lead uh, uh, her uh, startup. And add to this, if she working in science and technology and innovation, this is also a problem for, for women and men. So um, she cannot penetrate because she lady and she is working in dangerous area of science and technology and innovation. So she need to prove, she need to try uh, to get a, a lot of training um, she, so she can explain herself in front of bankers or uh, the venture capitals of any, any, anywhere. Number six that we are facing that uh, she cannot uh, access to uh, informal networks. The lack access of relevant uh, technical, sci uh, scientific, and general business network uh, make her facing a problem. And if she access to this work, it's essential for any entrepreneurs. If men or women, it's very important. Why? Because it develop if it, it, it will help her to develop a business idea. It will help her uh, to meet potential clients, suppliers, and the business partners, so she can understand the real market, uh, understand the market, develop and opportunities, and to understand the weaknesses of the market. Also to get a strategic information about cooperation and support so she can uh, explain her uh, idea or her startup in the right manner if she can uh, enter these networks. Number seven, the lack of a training or business training. Uh, we already good scientists, we are good, good in research, but we are not good uh, in making our idea to be present in a business manner. So she need training, she need mentoring, she need practice, she need advice, she need education and more skills. So this is very important and we lack this training in this part of the world. Number eight, the lack of role model. And this is, is not only in the Middle East and North Africa, it's everywhere to see uh, the women in the top jobs that she can explain how she do, do this and, uh, the, and send the positive message and to be the part that uh, the woman can uh, turn for mentoring and advice when they need this advice. If we make a network for role models uh, for women in science and technology that uh, the one that uh, she succeed in this field, I believe this will give passion and increase the number of entrepreneurs, women in this part of the world. So this is the eighth main problem that we are facing uh, in the North Africa and the Middle East, especially for women working in science and technology. And I believe entrepreneurship is always coming with the new ideas because if there is no ideas, it will be business. It's not to be entrepreneur. Entrepreneurs mean that we have a new technology or new how. New how. So I, I see the solution is start from a, a specific intervention. And this intervention should come from the top 
uh, 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 lead from the top, top management in the company, in university, in home, uh, in the country, it should coming from the top because the top will change all the bottom. And they will same explain this in details now. Also, we need opportunities for flexible hour. And uh, as Dr. Alam mentioned, and this is a good thing, uh, that uh, uh, now in the corona pandemic, it give us a golden opportunity to work from home. Uh, before the pandemic, it's very difficult to say that I need to stay at home. To stay at home, I can work, I can do research, and I can take care of my family, and also I can study the market uh, more widely. So this is opportunity now is coming because uh, the, the corona and the transformation of uh, the force industry revolutions for the workforce, it will give us this good opportunity. Also, mentoring uh, uh, is also helpful. We need mentoring. And uh, uh, as you see, women always have this is passion to support each other, especially women working in entrepreneur, because entrepreneurship always gives the passion uh, for the people uh, that we cannot uh, succeed alone. We need all the one around us to be succeed. So I always, I saw the women who work in entrepreneurship have this mentality. They are very happy to support each other. And by the way, in the, in the Middle East and North Africa, women are very supportive to each other. Uh, it's not as people mentioned, uh, absolutely not, because we understand our needs. We understand each other. We need to support each other so we can go uh, farther in our dream. Also, the solution, uh, as I mentioned, it's come from the top and top, we mean the top of government, industry, education to change the overall culture. And the, I believe uh, the, the SIG or the, the fast recipe that I can present that we need to formulate a clear policy for objective for promotion, women inter uh, interventors in, uh, in, uh, that have the mentality of innovations and entrepreneurship at national level. And this raising the gender awareness innovation policy by the followings that I will mention now. First, we need to uh, make the priority for innovation entrepreneurship for women. And this will not coming without the join up uh, approach that we can making and working in partnership with all stakeholders um, from innovation to business support, financial institutions, women association, academia, and the research center. We have a great initiative in this part of the world. But if uh, each um, uh, idea or each um, uh, movement coming in an uh, isolated island, we need to collect and join up all these people with each other so we can make uh, not double the effort or triple the effort. We can make one effort and this effort will be focused by networking all uh, these um, entities. Also, we can, um, we can educate stakeholder, stakeholders on the women specific needs. That is to say the obstacle that they are encounter in becoming entrepreneurs in science and technology. Make them understand this. And I believe now with the uh, internet, we can make awareness, infographs, and uh, explain all of these um, uh, things that women uh, should, um, uh, the stakeholders know about her. Also introduce gender awareness or gender mainstreaming in the government enterprise policy. And now in Egypt and Algeria and Sudan and Morocco, they start working in this, make awareness about uh, the importance that uh, the women uh, have lead uh, the enterprise uh, or uh, the startup. So there is a, a movement, but we still need more because the, we are lacking this from a long time. Also, we need the uh, planning for childcare provisions and uh, to, to, to make, uh, to go out of the books and to, uh, to see how we can support woman who is working and how we can make her feel comfortable when she working in business and she also take care of her child. I get uh, uh, some example. I like this example very much. In Belgium, they make something called the flying entrepreneurs. And this flying entrepreneurs, you can uh, ask him to help you during if the lady need to uh, leave or to have uh, uh, take care of her child or travel or anything, he, he can replace her during her absence. And so this is will overcome any problems that she may face if she leave for any uh, situation. So this good idea, so we can uh, create a lot of uh, innovative ideas that can support women when she need to leave for uh, pregnant for anything, because this is always the cut off of, um, of the, the stream or going of her business uh, during uh, her leave. 
Also, we need providing financial grants only for women in business and uh, in, in, in entrepreneurship, especially who is working in science and technology. We have these grants, but these grants in general, we need to focus for women to support women uh, to make her own startup and also give her training how she can present her idea in front of um, uh, business or uh, venture capital or government. Because if she working in science and technology, we, she will talk only uh, on science and technology. She will talk about education, about equation. She will talk about uh, the methodology, but the financial or uh, the financial sector need to explain the business plan, not only uh, the, 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 the scientific issue of her research or idea. Uh, the last thing we need skills uh, in the ICT uh, and also to train her in language because this is a good uh, thing to support her and encourage her to use the new technology. She can sell her product, her idea by social media or anything. And we in Arab Science and Technology Foundation make an uh, initiative for uh, empowering women in uh, rural area by using uh, Instagram and Facebook and Snapchat. If we start also the skills needed from the beginning, if we can put uh, this in our education system about entrepreneurial, because all, we, all of us, unfortunately, we didn't understand the meaning of credit or money. We always study science, technology, culture, but we never study how we can manage our own idea and how we can make real business. So my, my conclusion of uh, the presentation, uh, that while the issue of women in business and science and technology is seen as uh, gender uh, challenges, I see it's something very important for any country need to be go uh, for the further and uh, uh, to be uh, leading in the coming years because women is very important factor. It's not the problem, it's a solution, it's not a problem. Uh, thank you very much. I'm, I'm sorry if I take more time and uh, I'm really for any question. Shukran. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Dada Amel, uh, for that very nice and brilliant uh, presentation. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, I want to uh, probably give around three uh, to five minutes, actually three minutes, uh, just to ask questions, uh, if you have any, because uh, Professor Amel will be leaving. Does anybody have a question or a comment? Yes, Professor Amer. Uh, one of the areas I wanted to ask about, because it will later factor into my presentation, um, I teach my entrepreneurs using online business simulations or serious games where they actually create their own board games. Uh, do you, in your courses for entrepreneurs, use any game-based learning to help them develop either their presentation skills, their communication skills, their leadership skills? Uh, we make as a project. It's not like game because um, uh, before the pandemic, we uh, didn't make the course online before the pandemic. Now we start to transfer the course digitally. Uh, but in the in the past, we make it as a project, a project in the college or in the campus that we make the simulation that he have this is his own startup and how he can he can present this startup in front of his colleague and collect money from them if he they if they uh, like his uh, idea how we can get money from them and sometimes we make it as a project to go for uh, like malls or uh, work uh, the, like um, uh, shops and also explain him, him uh, her idea or his his idea to the people in the street. Uh, and sometimes it's really uh, fun, Yani, because they meet people and asking, we are doing innovation in the university and need support. If he didn't uh, uh, get this, he would not get the grade. At least, uh, Yani, uh, the, the small amount of the money. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Another one? Another comment? Right, I don't seem I don't seem to see another comment. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Gada Amel. Um, it was nice having you, and uh, if you have time, you can still stay around. Uh, let's now move to other presentations. Thank you very much. I will be with you uh, by my mobile, inshallah, during my <laughs> way into the college. Thank you. Salamu alaikum. Alaikum salam. Thank you very much. I think now we can have the other uh, presenters and uh, we shall not have questions until all of them have presented. Um, let me introduce all of them. Uh, our second presenter uh, will be Mark Ovens. 
and uh, he will be presenting on pandemic impact, the sustainable future of international office activity. And Mark is the deputy director, Global University of Portsmouth, UK. You're welcome, Mark. Uh, the next presenter after him will be uh, Dr. Alamedin Banaga, and he's around. Banaga is a senior expert Arab Planning Institute, Kuwait, and he will be talking about institutional governance in Yemen universities. And uh, uh, there will be another person who will be talking about the same topic, and that is Dr. Mohamed Batwa, a senior expert, Arab Planning Institute, still Kuwait. And then thereafter, we shall have our last presenter, and that is Dr. Michael Sutton. And uh, he will be talking about future application of game-based learning as a platform for reflective learning associated with entrepreneurship education in the Middle East and North Africa region. Uh, Dr. Michael Sutton uh, is a chief game-based learning officer, and the chief knowledge officer, uh, Unification USA. So ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming these speakers. Uh, please uh, go ahead and uh, make your presentation, starting with Mark Ovens. Thank you, Professor Joseph, and um, yeah, good afternoon, everybody. Pleasure to be here, and, and thank you, um, Professor Amma, for your really insightful presentation as well. So, um, I'm going to share my screen. Hopefully, everyone can see that. Okay, and. Um, We'll get started. So, yeah, good afternoon from, from Portsmouth. Uh, we're on the south coast of the UK. Um, as Professor Joseph said, my name is, is Mark. I'm the Deputy Director of the Global Office, um, which may be known in other universities as the International Office. Um, and I'm going to talk today a little bit about the impact the pandemic has had on us over the last 12 months or so. Um, so internally within the university, the activity that we carry out. Um, and then I'm going to put it into some context in regard to the University of Portsmouth and the setup that we have um, with, our, with our global office and specifically in the context of, of the MENA region. And then a few comments on, on what the future might look like for us um, moving forward as we hopefully start to transition out of this pandemic and with the lessons that we've learned and how we implement those um, going forward. So yeah, let's get started. I hope you find it interesting. So. At, at Portsmouth, um, I, I've broken down the impact of the pandemic into kind of three main areas. So for us, a large part of what we do in our, in our international office or the, the global office, as we call it here at Portsmouth, is about recruitment of uh, new entrants. So international students coming to study at the University of Portsmouth on our campus. And to give you an idea, um, we have in the region of 5,000 students from overseas who study at Portsmouth out of a population of about 25,000 students on campus. So about 20% of our students are coming from overseas each year. Um, and it's our responsibility as a global office to recruit, attract those students, uh, to help them through the application process, the visa process, uh, to welcome them on campus and, and help them kind of settle into the city and the university. So major impact for us, obviously 12 months ago, uh, travel almost came to a halt pretty much. Um, the large kind of recruitment fairs, study abroad fairs that we would attend were cancelled. Uh, large gatherings were cancelled and, and more or less everything moved to virtual events uh, fairly quickly after that. On campus, um, the university has remained open pretty much the whole time, but we had to bring in obviously social distancing, one-way systems and new modes of teaching. So the, the large kind of lecture theatre style teaching is, is uh, certainly something that wasn't possible and hasn't been possible for, for nearly a year now. Um, and then off campus, uh, especially for our international students, we had to bring in a lot of online uh, activities. So online registration rather than in person, online orientation. So all of our welcome talks and uh, kind of walking tours and city tours, all these things had to be moved to, to an online format and uh, to different, different modes of learning as well. Um, and what we found, um, you know, 12 months ago, we predicted that our, our new entrant international students may go down by about 50%. But actually, we, we've stayed the same, and if anything, we've actually increased the number of new entrants uh, at the University of Portsmouth in this period, um, which is kind of testament to the, the academic staff here at Portsmouth being able to move their content online and, and the university being really flexible and agile in the face of the pandemic. So those are the kind of short-term impacts. Um, and how does that affect our, our long-term thinking? So 
we're starting to see some some markets starting to open up again now, uh, which I'll touch on a little bit later on. But the key for us now really is to try and find what worked well during this period. And just because things may return to some kind of normality in the next one, two, three years, to actually implement those effective tools for recruitment and, and take them on moving forward. So I, I think in this, some of this is, is just my opinion, but I think there'll be some fairs, certainly will still carry on. There'll be some travel and there'll be some large gatherings and there'll be some virtual events. So what I see in terms of recruitment is really a hybrid uh, of what's happening now and what happened in the past, um, because students are, are still attending virtual fairs and it's easier for them in some ways to attend them. But at the same time, that value of face-to-face -face contact is, is still apparent. So I think we're gonna find a bit of a hybrid in terms of recruitment, how we move going forward. Um, and the same on campus. So we may not need social distancing um, in the kind of medium to long term. We may not need our one-way systems and our temperature scanning and our hand sanitizing potentially moving forward at some stage. Um, but there's no reason why we shouldn't keep these new modes of tuition. So the student feedback actually has been that they, they don't necessarily want to go and sit in a large lecture theatre at 9am on a, on a Friday morning. Um, they'd much rather have that video, uh, that, that content online, be able to pause it as they need to, make notes um, and access it, you know, at a time when they feel more effective in terms of their learning. Um, and then off campus, there's some, some really good changes that we think we can make in terms of registration being online, orientation being online, and, and again, that asynchronous learning. So definitely some things that we can take forward there. Um, for example, to be, to be a bit more specific, we had, we've had in the past some, some issues with students having big delays on getting their UK visa, for example, from Nigeria. At certain times of year, it might take a month to get a, a student visa for the UK. And so students have sometimes missed that online registration period and that orientation period on campus. But if we can keep that available online, then the, for those students who are, are facing kind of any unforeseen delays, they can still access that and they're not kind of um, negatively affected by anything that's out of their control. So um, that, that'll be the key for us. And, uh, you know, we talk about student numbers a lot, but the key for us is actually how do we increase the satisfaction as well of the students at the University of Portsmouth? Because uh, that is a really key factor in actually increasing the number of students here as well, because uh, word of mouth is, is still a huge factor for us. And the happier that students are, um, the more that, that feeds back to, to their colleagues and to their peers, to their families and their home countries, and, and the better uh, our recruitment could be. So I want to talk specifically about what we do at Portsmouth. Um, so we actually have six overseas offices around the world. So we have one in uh, India, Malaysia, Nigeria, China, Bangladesh, and Pakistan. And so you'll note here that we don't actually have an office in the Middle East, um, which I'll come to, to shortly. And the, the core responsibilities for these staff who are based overseas is to manage the key relationships in country. So agents, applicants, parents, schools, colleges, partners, embassies, and so on, um, to generate leads, to generate applications, and ultimately uh, they're measured by how many enrollments come from that country to the University of Portsmouth on an annual basis. Um, in addition to that, we have five staff based here in the UK in Portsmouth, whose previous, who previously would have been traveling out to uh, the, the rest of the world. And they're making the region of 100 trips a year. Um, myself, I, I previously was in one of those roles and I used to spend about three or four months a year in the Middle East um, meeting people in, in person. So two out of those five are actually looking after the Middle East market for us. And, and again, just talking specifically about the Middle East now, we, the position that we're in at the moment is we're coming from a, a very strong market share and base here at Portsmouth. Um, we've consistently achieved year-on-year -year growth, which I'll, I'll back up with some, some data shortly. And so the easiest course of action for us really is to, is to carry on doing the same as what we're doing, because obviously we're, we're seeing success in the enrollment numbers here. Um, and the reason perhaps that we haven't had a Middle East office previously was um, some of these factors here. So time zone, one or two hours difference in the most, in the most part, ease of travel, lots of flights from London to the various Middle East hubs, uh, Qatar, um, Dubai, uh, Muscat and so on and, and so that previous success has been, meant that we've, we've carried on doing what we're doing but obviously that there is a need to constantly innovate uh, there's constant competition in the region there's a lot of lot of universities in the UK out in the Middle East looking for students to come and study at their universities um, and the lessons that we've learned over the last 12 months have probably accelerated our decision making into saying that actually we will need to have a Middle East office um, to go with the other six offices that we have across the world as well quite shortly. 
Um, and just to confirm, just to, just to back up the kind of data around Portsmouth. So this is, these are the numbers from the British Council in terms of the number of students studying on campus from these countries at Portsmouth. So we are the, the top university in the UK for Qatari students. You can see we've had some um, quite significant growth over the last three years. Uh, we're in the top five for Kuwait and the top 10 for Egypt in terms of study destinations in the UK. And you can see with all those markets, some consistent growth over the last three years. Um, other markets include things like Jordan, uh, Oman and UAE. And again, strong growth or, or kind of with, with Oman, certainly um, consistent numbers coming to the University of Portsmouth. So just to, th those numbers are just to show that we are coming from a very strong position at Portsmouth. And the other argument for, for uh, how to work in the Middle East uh, specifically is, well, actually, at the moment, for the last 12 months, we've been doing it virtually, you know, completely virtually. So sat in the comfort of our, our living rooms, um, not spending any university budget on, on flights or office costs um, or hotels or, fair, you know, in-person fares. So why wouldn't we do that? Why wouldn't we carry on doing that? But actually, I think that, the, you know, we have to take into account cultural differences. So in-country presence can lead to a number of increased factors that we've seen already in the markets that we operate in, um, you know, in India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, and so on, of things like shared understanding, uh, trust, acculturate, acculturation, and, and dedication to the role. So that's why we're, we're um, certainly looking at setting up a, a Middle East base fairly shortly. Um, and, and just to kind of visualize that, so our, our current coverage you can see here the, the offices that I've talked to about around the world, um, including we've got, we've got two bases in China, so seven in total. But if we actually added one person into the Middle East region, we could then focus some attention more on the other areas that we, that we think we can do virtually. So the Americas, um, the rest of Sub-Saharan Africa uh, and some of Central Asia, for example. So this is the kind of visualization of what we're looking at in the, in the kind of short term future. And I don't want to spend, uh, you know, I could talk for, for hours probably on this slide, but the, the advantages that we've seen of having in-country presence are more holistic than just around student recruitment numbers as well. So there's, there's a lot of information on this slide, but things like um, overseas partnerships, uh, staff and students community, um, recruitment network, things like alumni, identifying partners, um, increasing student mobility, and formalizing partnerships in person. These are all things that are very difficult to do virtually. And that's why we're, again, we're, we're, we're looking at moving into the Middle East on a, on a more kind of permanent and, and um, in-country in country presence basis. Um, the other thing to consider, obviously, uh, and some of these numbers are, are estimates using the, the flight carbon footprint calculator online. But like I said, at the moment, we, we may, or not, not at this stage, but previously before, before COVID, we would be looking at going to the Middle East at least 12 times a year, uh, flying from London. So you can you can immediately see, um, and that doesn't include the internal flights once you get there. So for example, you might fly to Dubai, spend a day there, fly to Kuwait, uh, fly to Muscat, um, back into to Jordan and so on and so on. But by having someone based out in the, in the Middle East, we can immediately cut down on those London to Mina flights, those 12 flights a year. And it is part of the University of Portsmouth strategy um, to become a lead in, in environment, uh, environmental uh, sustainability and, and to become climate positive. That is a University of Portsmouth strategy uh, by 2030. Uh, so just to wrap up, there's obviously a lot that I've kind of gone through, but some of the things that we're considering then as we kind of move out of this pandemic period. So we want a hybrid model uh, to both teaching and recruitment, best of both worlds. So really looking at what worked uh, what were students happy with? Um, what was the feedback like? And how do we pick out the best parts of what's happened to us over the last 12 months and, and carry them forward into the new world? Um, environmental considerations, obviously, I've, I've touched on are, are important to take into uh, consideration alongside operational and financial. Um, we need to consider where face-to-face -face will work better than virtual and vice versa. So which markets can we continue to operate in virtually? Um, we want to future proof ourselves as well, because although we, you know, the UK is in a hopefully a kind of an upward spiral at the moment with the vaccine program, who's to say that something else couldn't happen in the future and where we've been able to continue to be active in country where we have staff based in country, we haven't been able to necessarily do that in the Middle East. So by having someone out there, we would more future proof ourselves. And the final thing is just that holistic approach. So I've talked a lot about recruitment, which is a um, key part of, of my role. Um, but actually having that holistic approach of having uh, somebody who's based in the Middle East um, and a sustainable approach in that manner is 
something that we we're going to be taking quite seriously over the next uh, short to medium term. Uh, so that's it for me. I'm, I'm happy to uh, to offer any questions, but I think also Professor Joseph mentioned that we we may go straight to um, another colleague to present. So thank well, you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mark Evans, uh, for that uh, brilliant uh, exposition about the pandemic impact and sustainable future of international office activity. Uh, let me invite uh, Dr. Alamedin Ebanaga uh, to talk about institutional governance in Yemen universities. Uh, I'm not very sure whether uh, Dr. Banaga, you are co-presenting with the Dr. Mohammed. Yes, yes, yes. Or please go ahead. You have uh, 12 minutes to present your work. The floor is yours, Dr. Uh, Banak. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, for giving me uh, this opportunity to uh, present the uh, situation and the solutions for the uh, governance uh, uh, issues in uh, Yemeni uh, university, universities. Uh, this uh, uh, paper or this uh, presentation uh, is prepared uh, by uh, me, uh, Banaga, and uh, my colleague, Dr. Uh, Mohammed Batwe, uh, who is uh, the main contributor uh, in this uh, efforts. Uh, actually, uh, we are going if to you don't mind, can you can you uh, press on the full screen? It will be better. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. So we're going to talk about uh, the uh, institutional governance in the uh, public universities in uh, Yemen. And everybody knows the situation of uh, of Yemen, a country living in uh, a conflict and in uh, unrest. Uh, however, uh, we're not going to talk about the external uh, issues affecting the university universities of Yemen. We are going to focus more on the internal uh, issues of these universities, because as you know, uh, education and the role of uh, the universities are uh, a prime uh, tool to achieve the uh, sustainable development uh, goals. Uh, we, our assumption uh, or our hypothesis, hypothesis is that uh, if the Yemeni universities uh, are able to improve uh, governance, then they will be able uh, to uh, provide uh, a good outcomes a good education outcomes, which will be reflected uh, in uh, the labor market and in uh, the uh, research and uh, in uh, the uh, knowledge uh, in the country. So we want to uh, explain the current situation of the uh, governance in these universities, uh, of course, there is external factor, as I said, uh, the general uh, state of governance in the country, and there is internal issue, which is the governance in these uh, universities, and this is our uh, and our our main uh, issue. So, of course, there are some uh, methodological. Uh, things which I don't want to talk more uh, much about this uh, because there's going to be a full fledged uh, paper which will be uh, presented uh, presented uh, for uh, uh, publication. Uh, but uh, I want to focus here on the problems and the challenges uh, facing the Yemeni uh, universities and uh, the governance issues, the means and the mechanism uh, of the institutional governance in the Yemeni uh, university. So, as I said, the governance uh, issues uh, is very important to improve the uh, situation and the uh, 
education level in uh, Yemen. And we're going to look both at the public universities and the private uh, universities. And surprisingly, we find that the private universities uh, were, uh, are better in uh, achieving uh, in, uh, institutional governance uh, indicators and uh, performance than the public uh, universities. So first I'm going to explain, uh, there are some theoretical aspects uh, in, the, in the institutional uh, governance. And I know, I know, know, and I know that all the participants uh, here knows about the institutional uh, governance. However, I can say that uh, there are three, uh, three main models for institutional governance in universities. The first is the academic, and uh, in the academic uh, model, more power is given to the academic uh, uh, bodies and to uh, the uh, professors uh, in order to uh, decide on the rules, the regulations, and how uh, the university works. And uh, this is adopted in many uh, British uh, universities and others. There is another type of uh, model or business model of governance, which is the corporate model. And in the corporate uh, model, uh, the universities are going to uh, apply the corporate governance. And here we find that uh, the universities focus more uh, on the financial aspects. So uh, this, this model might, uh, might ignore the other aspects uh, like uh, improvement of the uh, performance and uh, uh, like uh, participating the student in decision-making and these things. The best model for the best uh, model uh, for uh, the uh, the governance is uh, the shareholders, uh, the stakeholders model, in which we are, in which uh, we join all the shareholders, whether they are uh, professors, whether they are students, whether they are. Uh, uh, university graduates and uh, the other uh, other uh, share, uh, and the other stakeholders uh, in the university and uh, all play a, ro a role and all uh, have their say in the decision making uh, process so in order to talk, in order to uh, reflect the issue of institutional governance in uh, Yemen we first we first uh, reflect the state the current state of the uh, education or the higher education in Yemen. Uh, in Yemen, the higher education starts in uh, the 70s with two universities, the university with two public universities, the University of Sana'a and the University of uh, Aden. In 1996, uh, seven new universities were uh, added and so the total number uh, of the universities now jumped to 10 public universities and 25 uh, private uh, universities. Uh, however, as you know that uh, due to the uh, conflict uh, uh, in Yemen and the arrest, uh, there is many of the international uh, indicators are not, uh, uh, are missing for Yemen. Uh, however, we're going to uh, use the available ones in order to reflect uh, the uh, situation of the education in uh, Yemen. Dr. Banaga, you have two minutes. Please try to sum up. Two minutes, just two minutes. All two right. minutes. So um, this is uh, the human uh, the, the human capital in Yemen, as everybody uh, knows, uh, is uh, in the last ten uh, in the last ten, in the last ten uh, uh, rank in the in, in the international uh, uh, indices, and this is the most important uh, factors uh, 
uh, the most problematic factors in doing business in uh, Yemen. Because as we, as we say that, uh, we talk about the uh, private and the public uh, universities in uh, Yemen. However, we find that the government uh, instability uh, is the most problematic area in uh, Yemen. Uh, in institutional uh, factors affecting uh, Yemen, we find that uh, the rank of Yemen uh, is uh, in the last 10 uh, in most of the indicators. Uh, however, as I said, uh, we want to look at uh, the internal issues in these uh, universities. And we uh, divide the, uh, the challenges and the problems facing the Yemeni universities in internal uh, challenges and external uh, challenges. So in the internal challenges, there are challenges related to the university management and administration because there is a problem in uh, the way uh, the, uh, vi the, the vice chancellor are selected. They are selected normally by political uh, uh, backgrounds. And uh, there is uh, a problem in the financial uh, resources and the management of the financial resources uh, and uh, the uh, selection criteria for the students uh, themselves. And even the selection of the, uh, the uh, university uh, lecturers and uh, professors, depending on non, in, in many circumstances, depending on non-academic uh, non uh, grounds. Uh, also the inefficiency, the, 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 the university role and uh, efficiencies. And in this case, uh, we will find that there is no uh, collaboration between universities and uh, the outside environment. Also, we have got a problem in uh, the curriculum and the teaching uh, methods. There is no adoption for uh, the uh, current and the uh, advanced uh, curricula. Uh, and the admission policies of the, the student, it needs also a lot of uh, regulation because it is not based on uh, the uh, qualification. Uh, in many times, it's just based on uh, financial uh, grounds. The human resources working in uh, the universities, uh, there are a lot of uh, observation about uh, uh, those uh, people and the way they are uh, selected. So there is many uh, issues regarding the, uh, the universities and the way these universities uh, are uh, managed. And if, uh, if we can improve uh, these things, these internal things in the universities, the outcome uh, of, the, uh, of the universities and the research uh, will be uh, would be uh, good. So uh, we actually have got a, a, a plan or we have got a strategy uh, for uh, getting out of this uh, this uh, uh, this situation by applying uh, rules uh, gradually uh, and uh, by improving the performance internally in uh, these uh, universities. Uh, and here we give an example of two of uh, of two universities, which is uh, Sana'a University, which is a public university, and uh, the uh, Science and Technology University, which is a private university. And and uh, the private university uh, actually is doing better than the public uh, university in terms of uh, governance and uh, uh, institutional uh, performance. Uh, and here, uh, this shows uh, the means of adopting an institutional governance, governance in uh, Yemen. And as I said, there are a lot of uh, things need to be improved uh, regard, uh, in the Yemeni universities in order to improve the uh, governance. And if we can improve the uh, governance, uh, we can uh, have uh, good uh, outcomes and we can improve uh, the uh, labor market uh, situation, and we can uh, achieve the sustainable uh, sustainable development uh, goals regarding 
uh, education in uh, Yemen. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Banaga, uh, for that presentation. And uh, I think what we are going to do is uh, to have uh, a question and answer session. And um, uh, thereafter, we shall have the last paper. So can we take some more questions and the comments? Uh, two people have presented. Uh, we've had uh, Dr. Banaga, uh, who was talking about institutional governance in Yemen universities. And uh, if you recall what he's been talking about, he's been talking about challenges facing Yemen universities, institutional governance models in universities, where he talks about uh, three uh, models, the academic model, the corporate model, and the stakeholder model. Uh, then thereafter, he presents uh, problems uh, facing these universities and uh, some of these uh, uh, problems are grouped into what he calls internal. Uh, and of course, the other category is the external. Uh, the internal, he talks about financial resources, uh, curriculum policies, uh, and uh, of course, university administration. Then when he goes to the external, he talks about the political, economic environment, the social, cultural environment. Uh, maybe Dr. Banaga, you may wish to throw some light on some of these social cultural uh, aspects and how they impact on the governance of the university. Uh, but uh, before that, I also uh, know that towards the end, you are talking about ways to strengthen institutional governance. And uh, you are talking about um, uh, developing structures and regulations. And yet under the problems uh, where you had the internal and the external, you looked at these uh, uh, administrative regulations or structures as really problems. Um, maybe you can start with that and then we take on more questions. Dr. Banaga. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Doctor. Prof. Uh, Joseph. Uh, can I use just... Uh, regarding the, uh, these uh, administrative things in the many uh, universities, there are a lot of things. As I said, the universities can uh, improve. The way they select uh, the uh, staff and uh, the way they select the, uh, the administrative uh, workers and the way they select the student themselves. Uh, this is in the hand of the uh, universities because as I said for me in, in, at many times the selection is based on uh, either uh, financial uh, financial aspect or uh, is based or uh, is based on uh, social and uh, maybe tribal or other, uh, aspects. This distorts uh, the uh, process, and uh, in the end, you will, uh, in the end you will not get uh, that qualified staff. For example, if you are going, if you want to uh, select a teaching assistant, because he is belonging to uh, some tribe or some uh, ethnic group, uh, you will not get uh, uh, a qualified. And this is uh, a qualified uh, teachers, and uh, this is a big governance uh, issue. So if we could if we could improve these internal things in the universities, uh, the university outcome will improve. And you don't, you don't uh, because I, I didn't get enough time to, uh, to reflect the indicators, the tables which you saw in the, in the presentation. Uh, actually, there is, the, there is a disparity between these indicators. In some of the indicators, uh, Yemen gets the rank of uh, 130, six or 135 five out of 137. And in others, you'll find that uh, Yemen is getting the rank of, for example, uh, 55. 55 out of one, uh, out of one, uh, 135, 137 uh, uh, countries. So we need to look at the point of the strengths and the point of the uh, weaknesses in order to uh, take the advantage of this uh, 
strengths and uh, try to uh, to solve the problem with the uh, weaknesses. I think that there that, that is uh, a lot of things which these universities can do because we don't we don't want to say that because there is a conflict in uh, Yemen, there is unrest and everything uh, is bad. These universities can't do anything in order to achieve the sustainable development uh, goals. Because Dr. Banaga, Dr. Banaga the point is taken. Um, let's have more questions. Uh, is there any other person who has a question or a comment? Okay, no more question. Oh, yes, Professor Alam. Professor, there's a question from the social media. I was just, I'm just writing it to you. But the question to both the presenters from the Yemen, uh, earlier, it says earlier, we have uh, both the Minister of Sudan and the uh, Provost. I think this was referring to Dr. Barnaga, to the early session, we had the Minister of Higher Education of Sudan and the uh, Provost of the American University in Cairo. The question is saying both of them earlier is stressed the top priority for there in Sudan and Egypt and the whole region for higher education is infrastructure. How can Yemen University uh, re, if you like, reestablish themselves, given the destruction in Yemen, how can they cope, particularly those two people in the morning, they said the key, the, the critical, a key important issue for universities is infrastructure. How is the situation, he says, I think more or the question is more about how do you see Yemeni universities rebuilding themselves after all this long war now, particularly this is a key issue, infrastructure. I don't know if this this is uh, from the Facebook. Dr. Banaga, over to you. Okay, thank you. Actually, we find that there is a good success for the private universities. Uh, the private, as long as those private universities can finance uh, their activities by uh, by uh, taking a market uh, a market oriented approach they can provide uh, infrastructure uh, so uh, and there is some and there's some some money from the state directed to these universities the question is are the public universities using this uh, these public uh, funds uh, appropriately in order to improve their own uh, infrastructure and uh, provide uh, what is needed to the students the the answer is no I mean, if they use their resources efficiently, and if they look at uh, the other uh, types of finance, they would have uh, improved their situation. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, uh, Michael, do you have a question or we? Okay, fine. Um, let me just remind you uh, what uh, Dr. Mark uh, Evans uh, presented. Uh, he was talking about uh, pandemic and its impact. And, uh, uh, and uh, he did say that uh, this COVID-19 has, has had an effect on the recruitment uh, of students uh, at the university. Uh, and of course, they no longer have fares and if they must have them, uh, they have to rethink. Uh, no travel, of course, there were those bans, uh, no large gatherings and so forth. So there are also challenges related to on-campus uh, recruitment because of the social distancing and off-campus uh, online registration and, and, and orientation and so forth. And uh, he did also present uh, the global recruitment agenda of the university um, where he did talk about the virtual presence versus uh, the in-country presence. Uh, maybe I'll begin by asking Mark a question that is related to uh, student satisfaction. You did talk about student satisfaction and you are wondering whether that increases or reduces, uh, but I didn't understand exactly at what point you are looking at the student satisfaction at the time of recruitment or at the time when the student has been recruited and has tested the university or at the point when the university had, sorry, when the student has left the university. So could you throw some light on that? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. It's, it's very much both. Um, so there's an ongoing kind of feedback mechanism from students uh, who, whilst they're studying, 
So uh, especially during this period about how they are engaging online, what the content is like, um, how the university can improve, because it's all very new to the university to be delivering these programs on a, in a virtual manner like we are when we, we would usually be delivering them on campus. Um, and then we also have a graduate survey. So that would be for students who've finished, uh, who've finished their program. So all of this feedback gets, gets taken into account. Um, and like I said, it is really the, the challenge for the university now is to, um, I suppose, assimilate what, what's gone well during this period. Um, and rather than just going back to exactly where we were before, trying to integrate those things that have gone well in a positive light and, and take that forward to um, hopefully have a better student experience. Thanks very much, Mark. Uh, more questions or comments? Yes, Abdel, Adam? Thanks. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Um, actually, uh, oh, it's Adam who has a question. Okay, okay thank you very much again. I uh, just uh, unmuted now. Uh, my question goes to Banaga in Yemen, uh, who's uh, the, 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 a country which is going through very, very bad times and uh, uh, the war had uh, destroyed. It is infrastructure, it is a health system, it is educational system. And, but uh, in your talk, uh, I just noticed that uh, the, 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 the connection and the, for example, uh, between uh, local national higher education institutions and the uh, outside world, for example, uh, uh, the higher education institutions in the OECU or uh, even uh, broader pub public relations with the, uh, with the World Bank, uh, for uh, reconstruction and development. These areas, and especially the United Nations uh, uh, agencies, uh, which are uh, contributing very well to uplifting, for example, uh, uh, struggling higher education institutions to uh, stand on their feet. Uh, are you do, are you doing any, for example, are you uh, any efforts of, uh, to 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 get help, for for example, on the part of this uh, in, uh, these very very important institutions like the World Bank or EC, uh, I mean, or, uh, organization for economic uh, uh, for economic and uh, and for, for economic development and what do you call it, OECD. Economic uh, co cooperation and I think there's very little, very little uh, done in this uh, area. Um, I think uh, the, the those, uni those universities they are not they are not using the available available resources uh, properly and the external uh, resources, the, the external challenge channels of uh, of uh, of finance uh, properly. Uh, because it is about the human resources. It is about the, the, the people who are running uh, these universities and uh, the qualification. I mean, if you have got a, a, a poorly uh, qualified uh, person, uh, you wouldn't expect him to uh, to uh, look for external world and see the, and see the, these things. So, uh, capacity building. This is the first thing to start with. I mean to uh, to train these uh, these uh, people uh, in order to catch up with uh, other universities and with other uh, countries. And I think the uh, some of the uh, private universities are doing better than the uh, public universities. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Banaga and uh, Dr. Mark Ovens. Uh, thank you very much uh, for these uh, presentations. Uh, we certainly appreciate. I want now to move to our last uh, uh, presentation uh, before we receive uh, concluding uh, remarks from our host. And uh, this presentation is on the future application of game-based learning as a platform for reflective learning associated with entrepreneurship education in the MENA region. And uh, this it will be delivered by Dr. Michael, uh, Professor Michael uh, Sutton. Uh, Dr. Michael Sutton is an innovative researcher, 
uh, knowledge scientist and uh, learning engineer. And over the past 50 years, he has distinguished himself in the business and educational fields of game-based learning, uh, serious games, simulations, and uh, immersive learning environments. So I don't think you would have had um, a better presenter uh, than uh, Professor Michael Sutton. Uh, and Michael Sutton, you are welcome. Over to you. You have- Thank you. Questions. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> I really appreciate the privilege of being involved with this conference because I have an ongoing research project I'll be speaking about looking at entrepreneurship uh, within the MENA region and how game-based learning could definitely uh, have an impact on what is taking place with the Agenda 2030 SDGs. Part of the triggers for my presentation are the number of crises going on, the number of organizations like the World Economic Forum indicating significant risk, risk in the region. And of course, most of us are aware of COVID-19, but VUCA itself, the whole area of volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity that is actually gripping the world. It's not just uh, affecting uh, the MENA region. Another set of triggers is the incredible uh, investment and effort made by many of the countries in their national visions to be able to make changes to be able to conform to the SDGs for 2030. And of course, for me, one of the more significant elements of the UN Sustainable Goals is target 4.4 which is to increase the number of people with relevant skills for financial success. And of course, entrepreneurship is mentioned as one of the critical success factors. I also put out a paper last year on radical change taking place in higher education across the globe because of the pandemic. And this contributed as well to the, the reason for my presentation and paper. My personal interest is the fact that I've been involved in game-based learning uh, for probably the last 30 years, long before it became popular. And in 2019 published a text, uh, which apparently has become an interesting uh, touchstone for many people on how to integrate games, simulations, serious games, card games, role-playing games into the classroom both at the undergrad, graduate, and doctoral levels. And in fact, I've, I've uh, provided a number of workshops, even to faculty, to help them learn uh, how to make fun to engage their, their learners. Because critical engagement and commitment by the learners is waning significantly, especially during COVID-19, during the early uh, months of COVID-19, I tracked a number of different blogs and the number of complaints coming out by uh, learners that their professors were boring, that the they were expected to listen to three hours to a bloody lecture. Um, all of these things uh, contributed a great deal to disengagement by the learners. And, you know, many of the professors were just reacting to the fact that they'd never taught online before and were just struggling to get some course material up there. So for my study, I had to look at very, very significant and different definitions for all of these phrases, because all of them will contribute to the ongoing study I have in the MENA region. My macro hypothesis is really that entrepreneurship education uh, is the foundation across all the SDGs. In every country, we can see uh, occasional rises. Uh, we see a lot of uh, countries that are staying at the same place that they were at. And uh, real uh, integration of entrepreneurship in many of the different schools would have a significant, significant impact in 10 years on these countries. Uh, I have taught as a member of the Center for Entrepreneurship in a university 
and have taught a number of courses, both in leadership and in uh, teamship and entrepreneurship. And I can tell you that experiential education, especially in terms of using game-based learning, provides a capability for the learners to do double loop learning. They can learn about what they've learned about. And this is a reflective uh, approach to learning, uh, which helps and has successfully created in many of my learners a true entrepreneurial spirit to continue after, after the university period. My micro hypothesis is that certainly within the MENA region, games could become a significant uh, instructional method to keep the learners engaged, for them to learn while they're having fun. I mean, one of the biggest challenges I had with my traditional professors around me in the business school was they would come into my office, they'd see all these games and Lego, uh, and they would say, how is it that your students can learn while they're playing and having fun? And my response always was, well, isn't that where you started in a sandbox somewhere, having fun? That's how you did learn. What happened? And what we've forgotten is that reflective learning within the university setting, uh, because it's done a lot in corporate settings, has a, a very rich history uh, in the religious and spiritual reflective practices. Many of the uh, uh, spiritual communities really invest heavily in this area of the body, mind, spirit, soul continuum. And many of our universities has lost this perspective much of it is about wealth generation within the entrepreneur when in fact a balance is required. For example, in the Eastern mystery tradition, the whole integration of soul, spirit, heart, and mind is incredibly important. In the Western mystery tradition, much of the early writings uh, in, uh, let's say, alchemy and Rosicrucianism was about body, soul, and mind and the integration of these in a balanced individual. And that those who, who uh, increase their effort in this area will become the new leaders. So currently I have a number of research questions I'm uh, using to drive my study. And it's really about investigating where game-based learning has been integrated into entrepreneurship education. And by the way, entrepreneurship education as uh, Dr. Amir had mentioned uh, in her science and technology area, is not limited to business schools. It can be in the arts, as I've seen in Saudi Arabia, where they're teaching at a women's university uh, how to develop games. Uh, and it, it can be in the sciences or the social sciences. So these are, I'm currently carrying out a very systematic um, review of the different websites of universities throughout the MENA region, as well as a literature review of people who have published about what they're doing within their courses. So the whole foundation is around experiential learning. Before I taught in my entrepreneurship uh, faculty at university, the, the um, learners ended up listening to people lecture about entrepreneurship and lecture about how to build a business. Well, that just doesn't rate it. You, when you go out into the workplace, the first thing you're presented with is the fact that practice is the basis for learning about entrepreneurship. So I've been able to apply a number of different reflection models in my game-based learning courses. Uh, and those are based on affect, behavior, and cognition. So having the learners write about an experience they go through from the, term, from the perspective of how did it affect your emotions? How did it affect your behavior? And how did it, uh, it affect the way you think about the way you think? And deeper reflection produces this double loop learning in the learners where they learn about how they learn but it can only be based on going through experience. So in a number of my courses, I would use this type of rubric to talk about 
asking them to express how did they feel, uh, what have they done with their experience, and what, what do they think they learned from the experience. And it became actually revolutionary for many of them who have kept in touch with me because uh, this is one of the areas they specifically remember. When they had to blog or write a two or three paragraphs around their emotions, around their behavior, and around their way of thinking after a particular educational experience, uh, this was the key uh, course for them on learning within their whole undergrad business or MBA uh, curriculum. They said they learned more in this one semester about themselves and how to change themselves. So I want to open up for dialogue at this stage about uh, these kind of ideas. I'm very interested in learning from other folks about particular courses or curriculum that might be taking place in MENA that would correspond to people experimenting with game-based learning. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Michael Sutton, uh, for that uh, very brilliant uh, presentation. And uh, maybe we can open up uh, for discussions as uh, you have rightly indicated that you want to learn how other people are doing it. Uh, but maybe just to give a summary of a few things uh, that you have uh, said, you did talk about the triggers uh, for the uh, for the game-based learning, uh, and uh, you talked about issues like complexity, volatility, uh, conforming to the SDGs, uh, and so forth. And then you went into uh, experiential learning, reflective learning, and game-based learning. I'm particularly interested in uh, these three things that you've just talked about. I remember one of my PhD students, actually, uh, did her PhD on uh, uh, reflective learning, and uh, she did carry out uh, uh, the uh, quasi experimental designs, and uh, uh, she, uh, she did this with the decision makers uh, out there, and the results were quite interesting. So um, for me, these are very good things, and you've given us the loop uh, for COB, especially for experiential learning, uh, where you deal with the feeling, the watching, um, the thinking and the doing, and even those particular questions that you really, you really do ask. But let me first ask you a question uh, before others uh, come in. Um, are there specific exercises and uh, questions that uh, you have developed over time that you think are very, very useful, for example, uh, under reflective learning rather than the, uh, the, the usual question, like the ones we talked about, what, um, for example, surprised you today? Uh, what, uh, what did you learn? Uh, what made you curious today and so forth? Are there specific uh, questions uh, that you have now written down as a result of the experience that you have amassed out there that you think can help others uh, who are uh, undertaking entrepreneurial education? The quick, an the quick answer would be yes. Uh, the uh, slower answer would be I don't have them all in front of me right now. But the, the uh, approach I've always taken from an experiential and reflective learning point of view is they have to find, a learner has to find a way to express themselves if they're going to be an entrepreneur. Remember, they have to give the presentations at the senior levels and at a technical level. And so in order to do that, my exercises and activities uh, force them to think deeply about different emotions. Uh, I use uh, often a um, emotional quotient inventory as a way when they start my courses to identify their strengths and weaknesses in emotional intelligence. And then we use a number of exercises, uh, some of which I've outlined in my book, uh, to help them 
learn more about what their emotions mean. Fear, for example, they're getting up in front of a group of people. And the first thing that happens is they freeze. So I get them to think in terms of, okay, why did you freeze? What is it that you feared? Because everybody was there to support you. So I get them to really, really think deeply. I'll give you another really uh, interesting example. In my entrepreneurship course, one of the things other professors uh, did not understand why I did this is I gave each one of my uh, entrepreneurs or budding entrepreneurs $10 out of my pocket, not from the university. And they had to break it down into 10 $1 bills. And they had to go into town in groups of threes. And one was assigned as kind of an observer and they videoed it with their, their smartphone. The other was assigned as kind of a referee in case something were to happen. And the other person had to give away $1 at a time to people in the downtown area. Now, most of us know that if you try to give away money, uh, the biggest problem you have is, is people say, why do you wanna give me money? And what happened was all of the learners went through this process. Most of them came back to the class. We had a number of videos that I played and we got feedback on and I provided feedback to basically have them learn the different tools they needed such as communication tools, marketing, promotion, um, finance. Uh, and I, I said to them, the only rules of engagement, you cannot give away the money to a street person or a poor person. You had to give it to someone who looked like they were just walking down the street. Most of them came back with eight out of the $10. They couldn't give them away. So when they went through that experience and then I guided them in a structured manner over all of the different uh, competencies that are required by an entrepreneur because you're always giving away ideas. And from that, the learners that year that were in that course developed incredible business plans on how they would approach uh, new business ventures. And of the 22 learners in that course, uh, 18 of them built their businesses based on that one experience and the deep learning that came from reflecting on all of the different elements of their behavior, their emotions, and their um, uh, uh, way of thinking. So it, it's using tools and, and simulations and role-playing like that, that force them into a deeper understanding of themselves. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Michael. More questions or comments? I can't see any question in the chat room. Ron, you want to ask a question or comment? No, a slightly, slightly cheeky question though. Did the student get to keep the $8 or did you take it back? Because I took was... it back. Ah, right. <laughs> <That's> my theory. <laughs> yeah. if, if, as a venture capitalist, uh, when I give them ten dollars, if they can't spend it, they don't get it. Yeah, I think there's a biblical story. That something goes along those lines as well. <laughs> about uh, the um, one of the other questions. How and I greatly, I think, that's incredibly valuable uh, what you're, you're doing. Uh, but at, at undergraduate level as well, I think at, at postgraduate, you are trying to you know, very much develop the wider skills of the, and thinking ability of the, the, um, the student, which you, you are doing. But at undergraduate, uh, how do you assess some of these uh, things that you're doing? And again, you know, given that you've been very innovative in the way you teach, what is the, your innovation in terms of how you assess these, to make sure that it's fair, consistent, and it actually measures something that's educational value as well as um, you know the other you know sports job I, you know, I totally admire somebody who learns how to kick a soccer ball really well but you know should that be assessed in the same way as a, a quote educational intellectual skill, uh, skill well those were the exact um, questions 
my colleagues would have in the faculty <laughs> meetings. Yeah. Uh, if they're having fun, how do you know they're learning? Mm -hmm. So I adopted a number of rubrics that have been proven quite well through research. Yeah. I highlight, I think, four to six of them in my book that are exceptional at because they've been used and tested and they do assess learning taking place. So I was able to respond and we were going through at that time a um, initiation into AACSB as a business school. And my rubrics actually ended up trumping most of the other lecturers because they couldn't prove that their learners were, were listening to them for three hours and learning because all they had was a test or an essay. What I had was experiences and people being able to describe their experiences at such a level that you can evaluate the learning taking place. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Michael Sutton. Uh, I'm sure Professor Alam would be having some questions uh, posted on Facebook. Professor Alam? Yes, uh, a couple of questions. Mark, I think Mark left already, right? But uh, I can't see him, but uh, uh, is Mark there? I'm not sure, but let me uh asks a question i have for uh where is professor uh, michael sutton yes i am i'm one of the fan of uh, gamification and michael work is great really one of i think mark or michael is one of the well lead pioneer in this really now the question i would like to ask you and i forget to ask you this uh many times over the email last period now with all of us going online and as i said yesterday i don't know if you were watching the Pro Vice Chancellor of Bradford University in an article last week in the UK said that what we have witnessed in the last one year of abnormal, it is the new normal, which means we're likely going to be conversating like this for another year at least. So what we have seen is going to be the, so if you apply that to higher education, I think, I think he's right. I don't envisage we face a student face to face before October. I don't think we're not going to have anything now. So. Game-based learning or all your fantastic work in using games, it needs, it doesn't need social distancing. It needs people to be come together sitting in the table. So what is the situation if someone now is asking, how can what you do be, can, you, can we use it? Can you let people use game-based learning? Can you teach people how to do it virtually now? Can you? Absolutely. And in fact, uh, most of the serious games and simulations that I used in my classrooms were virtual. They were online. So the learners would work in virtual teams because in the future, they're going to be working globally in virtual teams. And many of the entrepreneurship uh, games now uh, teach collaboration as opposed to competition. And so many of these online games allow the individuals to interact just as we're interacting now and give them the capability to learn skills in leadership, management, teamship in the virtual setting. So yes, one does not have to have people in a room. I was privileged to also have that uh, capability with my learners to bring them together in workshops, but one can bring the learners together in virtual workshops uh, online to, to learn about strategy, to learn about running a business. These games uh, or serious games and simulations are all available. It's a question of course, like anything else, uh, what is the cost of a textbook versus what is the cost of a seat in an online learning platform for this type of thing? So there is a cost issue but many of the companies, because we've now moved into virtual environments, are trying to market these tools at a lower price than they used to in the past because it's giving them market share. I mean, let's be realistic. If they can start to talk about uh, running online simulations in uh, building a brand new business at 45 universities instead of 10 or 150 universities instead of 10, uh, they're they're acquiring market share like they've never known it. Okay. 
Thank you very much, uh, Professor Michael. I think we'll take one more question, and this will be the last one. Uh, Professor Abdel Adam, please go ahead and ask. Uh, thank you very much uh, again. Uh, uh, just my question goes like this. Uh, uh, conventionally, actually, uh, our MENA states uh, inherited uh, an educational system uh, uh, left by the colonial powers, uh, a system which divides higher education into three distinct uh, parts. First is the academic education, which he focuses on, uh, it focuses on what the subject may do to the student. And uh, the a second uh, division is uh, advanced uh, education. Uh, and this is to do with what the student himself may do to the subject. And the third is the professional education, which he, uh, is uh, based on what or focuses on what the student do with the subject. Actually, this is uh, the transmission of the, the skills and knowledge required for uh, practical work. So. From your uh, from your own presentation, I think uh, the uh, these three divisions. Do you think still? Uh, do, do, do you think uh, do you still do you think that they are still relevant? Or uh, because I, I I can see that uh, it, it is favorable to your uh, to your presentation, especially the 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 last the last uh, the last of the three points adam adam your question your, adam your question is taken i think you are talking about the relevance of those three absolutely yeah we, we can third, ask most, i think the, th the third one is the most relevant one is because it is to do with the transmission of skills and which are and, and knowledge which are useful for practical work uh, and, and and this is very uh, connected with his uh, with his model of uh, of game game based learning. Okay, thank you, uh, Professor Adam and uh, okay. Professor Sutton. You can answer that. Thanks very much. Uh, one of the elements we're dealing with, Adam, is the fact we are in the midst of incredibly volatile radical change. I agree with you that the post colonial uh, occupation of, of Africa and most of the MENA countries uh, and the education systems that were instituted are now totally out of place. Regretfully, uh, most institutions are having to make very, very strict parsimonious choices on how they will proceed. In North America, many universities are going out of business because the students are no longer attending them and therefore they do not have the revenue anymore because their way of teaching is totally out of date. The lecture method came from Aristotle. We have not changed since the medieval period. And of course we have many institutions all based on the lecture method. So from my point of view, uh, and I am um, in a minority in North America, we need to turn education on its head. Otherwise, what we're seeing is private industry here is taking a much more experiential approach and they are making much more money and therefore more students engaged than the public universities, simply because we have outdated models. Now, of course, that's just my personal opinion, but I've seen it in the learners as soon as they're presented with an engaging instructional method that they actually learn from, they're all over it. The, the problem I ran into was my own faculty rebelled against me because my evaluations from the course were at the very top and all the boring professors were at the very bottom and they'd been there 20 years before I arrived. So, we're in the midst of this radical revolution in how education will be taught. And there are many in North America who are speaking at this stage about the fact that we no longer need universities of and by themselves because 
the private sector can create certificate programs that have much more power in upskilling the learners with relevant, useful competencies than the universities who only teach them how to take a test. And that's not what they do when they get to the real world. Dr. Professor, are you done? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Michael Sutton. Uh, uh, participants, um, join me in thanking all the presenters uh, who have uh, uh, given us their presentations in this session. Uh, Dr. Michael Sutton, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Mohammed and Dr. Panaga, thank you very much. Uh, Professor uh, Dr. Mark Ovens, uh, thank you very much. And Professor Dada Amel. Uh, I will return uh, the microphone to our host, uh, Professor Alam Ahmed, uh, President of the World Association for Sustainable Development and Director of Middle Eastern Knowledge Economy Institute, uh, founder to give us concluding remarks. Over to you, Professor Alam. Okay, thank okay. you very much, Professor Joseph. Thank you very much. As usual, you master, you are the master in managing this uh, convention. I mean, thank you very much for all of you. I will just, because I think we just 17 minutes above our time, but I'm really quite uh, uh, impressed uh, because normally academic conferences, we run over time by hours, but now I don't think we have run more of time because we lost time in the morning with the internet. So I would like to thank you all very, very much from yesterday. But before that, uh, Mervin, can you show on camera again so people can see you and all others? I mean, we have plenty of people who are working very hard to get this done. Mervin is one of them, really without him, we can't get the very important part outcome of this because the papers will be published, books can be edited and published, but really the real thing is this value of the, we have seen Professor David Reed earlier mention about short videos. Really that the aim is to cut the story of each of these talks in the future into maybe six or 10 minutes talk. But the value of having these videos is extremely important. We know that because they are being used by many, many universities. They use them, they are free on the on YouTube channel. But in order to get them decently edited, that's very important. So thank you very much, Mervin. We also have many people that work behind the scenes. Some of them, you know them because they communicate with you like Janet Snow. We have uh, someone which you don't see normally who does all the graphic really, um, uh, Suhail. Uh, thank you very much for all those who work very hard. Thank you, Dr. Mohammed Hassan from the University of Southampton. He has connected us with many people uh, either in Egypt or in his university. Uh, Dr. Mohammed al Mansouri from Libya and people from uh, Bahrain, from Qatar, really the list is very long, Sudan and others. But I think uh, the, many people will, will need to know the, where we're going with this. I think number one, we will try to collect as many as possible the summary of all this conference and try to write maybe a policy brief or something. Normally the difficulty, everything you ask for people, volunteers these days, uh, they are still willing to volunteer to edit and to help. But the problem is, uh, it's becoming very difficult for anyone to volunteer his time now. So we will, uh, we have uh, as a conference as well, lots of uh, policy brief to finish. Uh, we're still wa wa waiting to get help from, and we don't want to give it to any volunteer. We just want someone who can really edit them in a good manner. But the, 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 the fact we have the videos uh, that gives us uh, maybe a security, we can get it done anytime. So we will definitely write the summary. We will send it out. Uh, number two, there's so many people contacted me. I know they are very interested. I got from Morocco, for example, wanted to contact with this professor or this university. And you can see many universities are very open for international collaboration like AUC today, the morning. Yesterday, the vice chancellor of Southampton said they're very open for international collaborations. We hear it also from Egypt, from many places. So I think anything we can connect people, we will do it. Uh, number uh, three, uh, some people have already submitted articles. I know we have received them and there are people who still have a chance to submit like Yemen, they are finishing their paper, they will send it. We will get these all published. And the good thing is, uh, Anything we publish now, uh, if it's in the conference proceeding, it, go, it is an IC, uh, ISI. Uh, if you go to the Web of Science, all our conference proceedings are there from 2005, I think. 
And it's a very hard job really to update them in the ISI, the Web of Science, because you need to contact them and they get bombarded. But the good thing is our conference proceeding are ISI, definitely 100%. Our, uh, all our journals are uh, through Brockwest are reaching every university. I have seen them by my eyes. So if you go to Harvard, you go to Oxford, to Cambridge, any university, they are subscribers to this Brockwest. You can find our International Journal of Sudan Research, International Journal of Food, International Journal of Knowledge and Innovation in the Middle East. This is our flagship journal. We are going through a very, uh, I mean, applying to this, uh, what is it, uh, Scobus. It's, it's, a, it's a laborious work, you have to foot it, but I think we, we, we're going, to, I'm just looking for the last year for someone to finish some of these journals with the SCOBUS, because the problem in the Middle East and Africa, or all over the world, all universities, they want you to publish an SCOBUS uh, run journals, all of them, they ask for this. And uh, we know we have all the criteria, we discussed this with Emirates. I mean, we have journals already because the SCOBUS uh, status. But uh, we are doing that. Uh, the, we are we going to be doing, I have seen Ihab Taufik from the other journal of the food. He already started inviting more to the editorial board. We need to really uh, revitalize the editorial board. We have many people lined up. We need to put them really, we need to benefit them at a higher level. They have been extremely helpful to the work we do in the journal like Professor Joseph, but we really want him to get into the editorial board to now take a role in, in helping. I think we're going to do all that. There's many people, we have them, Muhammad Hassan in the other journal. We need people to take, even myself, I'm getting really exhausted. So we're going to do that as soon as possible. The other thing also, all these videos, Mervin started from yesterday, which is very fast really, but all every session will be in a long video uh, uploaded to the website, cleaned, and then Mervin will go through each uh, talk and cut it separately. So like today, just a session we finished, you will have a one video, maybe 20 minutes for say, Dr. Michael Sutton, you have another one say for uh, uh, Mark, for uh, Yaman Baber. This is how we've been doing. And I think it's been very successful and it's proven very useful. We have been doing this, it's a very hard job and it's a very expensive job, really time and money. But we, we realize the benefit of that. So we're going to be seeking, I don't know how long we're going to be locked, but for the next three, four months, we're, we're doing as much as possible to get all these video clean. But uh, that's where you will see all these videos, and I'm sure they all recorded very well. The, 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 the also quick, quick points, uh, we couldn't announce it because I didn't get the official email from uh, Scholar One. I'm sure you all know Scholar One, but Scholar One, uh they going to or we're going to have a memorandum of understanding between West and scholar one corporation uh in the us to partner together to is bread or to try to get as many as possible generally in the middle east and north africa into scholar one and i think that will be a tremendous change because if the journal is using scholar one that will get it, it will bring them or give them a big uplift to try to use the standards or international way of managing the journal. And scholar one is very much connected with the reference style, the same, which is used by the big names like Emerald, Oxford, and all of these. So uh, yes, in, in, in principle, we agreed, but uh, the manager or the director of the scholar one in London or in the UK, he was on holiday. So he emailed me, he said uh, he will try to get it done. Uh, but I haven't received it today, but in principle, yes, we're going to be officially announcing this. And I think we will, we will expand it, not just to North Africa, but to the entire Africa. We have you in, in, in mind, Professor Joseph, universities like yours, if you do any journals, why not? We try to see the only problem with the scholar one, not, not with the scholar one, but it's, it is, it is a commercial product, which we have to find money for it. But we will try to do our best to try to help in getting as many journals using Scholar One, which will uplift the journals in the Middle East and North Africa. But as I said, we are very keen on Africa because we are well spread into up to the way to South Africa. One of our key founders is South Africa, University from South Africa, Professor Lainty Louis. I think we need to get that to them. The other thing, uh, we will keep you updated. We, have, we don't just run a conference. We always do this by demand. Last time the demand was online learning and we have a fantastic conference. Many people emailed me, I, have, I don't even know them, just watching the videos, Ron was there, I remember in the last one. Now we have done this because people, they really want to talk about the future of the, uh, 
higher education, particularly the new normal now is online learning. You have seen yourself this morning, the minister herself, she's struggling with internet. Yesterday, one of the speakers from Egypt, the line cut. We had someone from the ministry yesterday struggling. I remember also we had a professor from Cairo University uh, the other day, also she had a problem. You can see the Middle East is really struggling with the internet. So, and this is a new normal, is online. So we're really going to be doing lots of effort of this. I can tell you now what is next in our agenda because we can see that many countries speak about this is artificial intelligence and data science, particular artificial intelligence. We do have expert in this, interestingly from the Middle East, but we're going to focus on this. We are learning every time uh, uh, how to make the best out of this uh, environment, uh, not just necessarily the Zoom, but to use it to our best. Uh, and I think we manage to learn every time. So the more we're learning, the more we manage. Now, everything you have seen here has been broadcast in eight different social media. I already got huge feedback on, I'm being circulating it. Uh, every time you see me on the, on the phone, I'm sending messages to the minister, to the others who have been speaking on yesterday and today, uh, because that's the, that, I can't really manage everything. Uh, we just, many things come from the social media as well. So that's the other thing. Uh, we are being very keen on helping more practically. We got many people from our advisory board, from those who really started this work long time ago. And many people have asked for their expertise and we're going to make this available as much as possible. So we, we are looking at different partnership with universities, try to see how can was or the Middle East deliver programs to universities remotely. So like uh, Michael said, you could be teaching a course to an MBA program uh, and students will be formal. This, this, he's here now, he could have been teaching, Ron, Alam, anyone. Is, there's so many people in our network interested. The one thing I want you really to make the benefit of it, we are very well connected with many institutions in the Middle East. So if any institution, I know these many people are watching us now, interested to have a robust connections with uh, institutions in the Middle East, yes, we are. We, we will do our best. And I think finally, the concluding comment, I think I learned, uh, I was expecting it, the major challenge facing the Middle East higher education institutions and the future of the higher education is really the infrastructure. And with the infrastructure, I think the internet will come in the middle of that. I was surprised, but, but not shocked when the minister from uh, Libya yesterday said, Many universities in Libya, they don't even have toilets and they don't have drinking water. And then we asked a question to the professor from South Carolina yesterday. And he said, if a university does not have a toilet, it should be closed. Not because that's the American standard, but I think that's the standard you expect. How come you teach a student, they do not have a place, there is no toilet. This is something I have seen in Sudan in many countries. In the same opposite, uh, or in the same, if you, if you flip the coin, I visited a university in Tunisia at the very end of Tunisia, and you just have to cross to Italy. Italy is like half an hour from there. You just cross the, um, the Mediterranean. Uh, this is called Janduba, which is one of our partners. In that very far part of Tunisia, they have a good infrastructure. Even we had lunch in the students' canteen. The vice chancellor wanted to show us a real experience of a university in the middle of, uh, I'm not saying a desert, but it's very remote place. They have reasonable human uh, environment, if you like. Girls and boys, they have uh, everything. So for you to be shocked to see in big cities in Middle East, a university does not have a drinkable water. It's true, I have seen them. So I think the issue of infrastructure is not just about the laboratories or what we have seen yesterday from Southampton, uh, a multi-million investment in, a, in an excellent uh, engineering labs, but the very basic water, I know it's shocking, but water is not available in many universities in the Middle East. And that's why no wonder you can see in the ranking of universities, those in rich countries are very high now, like Qatar, who is leading now? Saudi Arabia, Qatar, UAE. And they all by nature, they invest. It's not just they have the money, but I think they are investing in higher education. But those old ones, they are not investing. So I think that's something also, uh, and they, so the infrastructure is critical. And I think uh, the internet, definitely, definitely governments, I think this is a government policy need to consider this because I don't believe at all. I mean, I have written many times on ICT in Africa, in the Middle East, 
even now we are working on a paper on e-learning in the whole Middle East. We are reviewing lots of articles. I don't believe you cannot or you will you, you cannot find a reasonable internet in every university in the Middle East. Why? Because if you go to a country, so Tunisia, Sudan, Morocco, whatever it is, Egypt, for example, if you go to any big uh, private sector entity, you will have first class internet there. In the same country, the same city. So if you go to Sudan, to big companies for where we did the project on private, public private partnership, you enter the building, you immediately have the WhatsApp. So you sorry, you can have the, um, what is it? The Wi-Fi and you are perfectly working. It's a working environment. You just go outside to a university, there's no internet. So it's not the lack of availability in the city, but they don't seem to uh, understand and appreciate the importance of investing on their in internet. And what we are arguing for universities in the Middle East is just basic connectivity, something like you can talk to people, so something you can get a professor from the UK or America to deliver a talk to students through Zoom. We're not really asking about advanced internet or broadband capability like here in the UK. And I said this before, and many African professors, uh, they were unhappy with my statement, which I brought from Africa at that time. I gave, uh, in one of the conferences uh, about Africa, I gave a short uh, a slide where I, take, I took a quotation from the African Universities Association, which is a big association bringing all African universities together. What was the Secretary General at that time saying? Saying the broadband, in an average African university is 50% less than what on the broadband someone enjoy in his household, like mine. I am in my house now. So the broadband, the quality or the speed I have here in my house is double the speed an average university in Africa is having. But again, I am paying 50% than what that African university is paying. So it's very expensive and it's not very fast. So when I brought that quotation, many African universities, I remember in Kenya in particular, they said to me, no, you didn't come to Kenya, you didn't see. I said, but this is an average university. This is a quotation from your own African uh, University Association. So there are still universities, many of them in Middle East and North Africa struggling. And I don't think the issue of, of, of lack of internet there, but they don't really invest on it. They need to pay money for this internet. They need to understand it's very important uh, so that's that's the key issue. I think we're going to be doing the other. The final thing is uh, with infrastructure. No one is expected a high quality, top of the ring buildings and infrastructure like what I have seen in UAE or in Qatar. I visited the Doha Institute where Dr. Hind yesterday was talking. First class facilities, everything uh, is more of a in our here in the UK is considered first class or VIB, if you like, like uh, building. But uh, no one expected that, but expected a reasonable infrastructure. And in that infrastructure, what we have always been arguing for the Middle East universities and research institution, please is bent on a basic item called generators. Just buy it, Honda, whatever it is. It costs millions, yes, but it's not that very expensive when you compare to the budget of an institution. Have it supply at least a couple of classrooms, the dean office, staff room, library, because that what is the case, electricity is a major problem in Africa. There's no question about that. The major challenge for development in Africa is electricity. So this issue really higher education they need to consider. I don't want to go along in the list, but that's really some of the key things. I think they have been reinforced or re-emphasized by most of you. I would like to thank you all. We learned a lot and I'm sure when you see all uh, whether the proceeding on the or the video library, we, now we are, we are, we are becoming more innovative, creating what we call it video library, where you can open the, the PDF. And really we have been very good in doing this, but it just needs times. You will see the lecture as, as videos actually with small notes. So you can actually have it as a PDF, send it to anyone. He or she will just click and enjoy the lectures of everything. Plus we are moving further up to enhance the value of everyone. Because I think the fact now, you know, uh, Michael Sutton, you know, um, Ron, you know, Joseph, you know, whoever it is you have known from yesterday. The fact you know this bears on his background, you can easily then connect easily. You don't need to come back to us. So that's something we really need to enhance. To see Mike Sutton, see his talk, see his books, see his workshops, see his videos in, in one place. 
Uh, so we are trying to leverage the technology as much as possible. We are pushing as much as possible to try to use what we have here in abundance to help those in, in, in scarcity. So I would like to thank you. I would like to just say good afternoon. Enjoy the rest of today. We are in, the, in London. It is the afternoon. I see in America in the morning. Those in the Middle East already going into the uh, early evening. Those in Malaysia, I know they are already going to nearly going to bed now, 10 o'clock or something. And some are already sleeping. I know them. Like uh, in Indonesia, they are just about to wake up. So thank you very much. All the best. We'll get back in touch with you. And uh, I'm sure once we get the videos, we will send them to you. We will send you a certificate of your participation, definitely. And I think we will definitely need to spend more time sending you a proper letter because I think you all need to be acknowledged formally by a letter, whatever that letter will use for. But I think you have given lots of time. Thank you all to all the track chair, the moderators, the rapporteurs, everyone. There's many people who help. And thank you very much to uh, who else I forget to mention. Anyone, even for the viewers, those who send us the comments, uh, the critical question we receive, we want to assure you we have them in the Facebook. We don't delete them. Uh, those we, we failed to send them to speaker at the time, we normally share with them. And I think we need to say goodbye now. Mervyn, can we have this for this session? Because there's three speakers here. Can we have a, a picture for this? Uh, anyone who wants to join, he can show his screen. We can just have a final one for those last session, please. So please remember, if we all help and do a little bit, it will make a big difference.